Hello and as always, welcome to the Tales Inspire podcast. I'm your host, Chris Patel. And before we begin today's podcast, I have a few really important things to talk about. So first of all, we've got our live workshops that are going on in schools throughout the whole of the UK. We're doing them to really embrace children to be the best version of themselves. Raising awareness about social injustices, such as homelessness, refugees, and mental health, and so much more. And building empathy, trust, and resilience in classrooms. We're also doing things with adults as well, and it's something that you can all be involved in. We also have our Patreon page where you can donate as little as two pounds a month to this inspirational movement and help us grow to really impact people's lives. So before we begin, that's that. And now I guess we can get straight in to our person for today. So our Tales of Fire guest today is Aaron Lee. Now Aaron shares his story about wanting to be a fireman but his journey didn't really go in that direction. He ended up being in the police and had some, I guess you could say, awakening moments that really hit him hard and changed the direction of his life forever. And actually he would not be doing what he does now if it wasn't for the difficulties he had during his time at the police force. So he's impacted so many people's lives and it's something that you will not want to miss. So I hope you enjoy this really inspirational podcast. Aaron Lee, welcome to the Tales to Inspire podcast, mate. How are you? I'm good, mate. I'm not too bad. How are you? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, busy, <sighs> stressed, and but I'm all right. There's so much going on for you at the moment, isn't there? Yeah, um, just uh, organising the game. It's just a 24-7 job, so yeah, it's taking over my life a little bit. <laughs> so you better be good at football. Well, I will tell everyone what's coming up later, but you better be training in the football side of things as well, to be fair. Um, but Aaron, do you want to introduce yourself, who you are, where you're from, and we'll just go from there. Yeah, so I'm Aaron Lee. Uh, I'm a firefighter and I'm currently based at Oldham Fire Station uh, and I live in Milnrow. So, based in the northwest, and where did it all begin? Brothers, sisters, what was your childhood like? And like, tell us a little bit about the beginnings. I had a really good, really good childhood, really good upbringing. Um, myself, my dad, my mum, and my older brother, um, who I'm still in contact with. Um, yeah, I had a really happy childhood. Uh, lots of football, loads of friends. Really close knit family, um, yeah, good, good, good memories of my childhood. What did you want to be? What was it as a kid? Did you want to be a firefighter for as a kid, or was it the football? What, what did you want to be? Yeah, I think, I think to start with, it was the football. Like I was obsessed with football. I was out with my older brother and all his mates, and they used to just bang me in net every time because I was the youngest. And it's like just you just take it, don't you? Um, and then I think I guess as I as I got into school. Um, and started thinking properly about my career choices. I I just was drawn to the idea of being a firefighter. Um, the whole hands-on and the physical approach to the job was just amazing. Obviously, I was obsessed with blue lights, so it was like it's just a childhood dream, wasn't it? But I think I guess it was probably school that made me think about it more. What was school like? Were you one of those academic kids who was always working hard, or were you a little bit like, you know what, I'm not doing anything at school, I'm just going to... Like what, what was school like for you? Oh, do, do you know what? I, I, I was quite good at school to start with. Um, I would say the last two years, I kind of took my foot off the pedal a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I was quite good. I was never top of the class in anything. I was kind of just the grey man, the little the middle man. Um, but you know what? I was I was all right at school. I always got good grades. Um, and then, like I said, I think, I think just as I got into the last couple of years of secondary school, um I think with all my mates, we were just obsessed with football and it was just like the 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 school that took a back seat and and it was more about just being one of the lads and and you know being with my mates all the time. And I mean I still scored, you know, I came out with decent grades, but um and probably not as good as I was predicted when I joined secondary school. But no, I'm uh, I'm in a good place. I love that. So where does your journey go from there? You talked about school. Do you go to be a, fire, a firefight straight away or just what, what happens? No, I took a, I took a path uh, slightly the long way around, I would guess. But um, I left school and went to college and did a pre-uniform services course because I was like, if I don't make it as a fireman, I, I want to be a police officer or, or in the armed forces. So I left school and, and did that course for a year. And then off the back of that, I, I applied to join the RAF as a firefighter, um, passed all my selections, went down, started my training, and then got quite a nasty injury to my right arm that that needed uh, a couple of operations. So that was kind of like 
I don't know whether it was written in the stars or what, but it was uh, it was decided that the RAF wasn't my career path at that time. So I came out of the RAF, um, and and yeah, I just I kind of after that I just I just did the odd the odd jobs, a bit of labouring here and there, and nothing kind of see because the police weren't recruiting at the time, and you have to catch them. It was like, were well, you either do you just sit around or or you know wait for the fire service to to open the lines? So I did. What was it like not being able to do the RAF? Like you had your plans, that was what you wanted to be, you kind of, and then something out of your control, that injury, like how how did that feel as a young man? I, I don't know. I, I don't think I was that bothered, to be honest, Chris, because because I was so young, I knew that that leaving home, I was the only person out of all my close mates that was going off to, to be in the forces. So I think it was like, well, you know what? That's not going to happen now, but I'm not going to get homesick you know, I'm I'm going to be off out every weekend on the lash with all my mates. So actually, I didn't really, it didn't bother me too much. And I think I was, I was young enough to think, well, you know, there's still loads of time to make that happen on on civilian street. So, yeah, it was just I just kind of accepted it and 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 went and moved on. Okay, and I think that's something that's really cool about being so young that you've not lived your life and then it all comes crashing down. So that's oh, really cool, right? So you've got you've got. <laughs> Doing the odd jobs, labouring, and you're not in the RAF anymore. Or yeah. going towards that, like, how long were you doing the labouring for, and, and where did your journey go? Yeah, so it was a, a couple of years. Um, I would say until I was about 23, um, and then I wanted to be a fireman. That, that was it. I was I was hell bent on it. Um, so I looked at it, and again, they weren't recruiting. The fire service was so difficult to get in because back in the day when I was applying. You had to do it on the phone, so you had to ring up, and if they'd open the lines at nine o'clock, and if you weren't lucky on there, you'd get the engaged tone, and then you all the applications will have been gone. It literally was like a sellout <laughs> within a, a minute. Um, so you know, it was one of them. So I, I just I bought my time and, and I waited, and the fire service weren't recruiting, but I had a friend um, that I'd met who was in the police, and said, "Oh well, we're recruiting. Like, why don't you come and join us?" Um, and just bide your time in the police until the fire service. And I thought, you know what, it's not not a bad idea that because it was always a second choice option, the police. So, um, so yeah, I applied and I got in as a police officer, and then that was me for for kind of nine years. Um, didn't even think about the fire service during that time. It was just I was just on with my career, and then I would suggest maybe kind of the back few years of that nine years. I just started to really not enjoy the police, the changes and, you know, I guess this complete lack of respect towards police these days. And I think everything, not enough numbers and the workload piling up, I think everything just just got on top of me and I was I just weren't enjoying it. And I decided that, you know what, this is not the career for me for the next 20, 30 years. Can, can you give us, Aaron, can you give us an insight what it's like to be a police officer? You, uh, for some reason, I think... As kids, it's kind of glorified. Yeah. In the police, you're going to be putting away bad people and all this kind of stuff. But can you give us a little bit of an insight what it's like to be a police officer? Some yeah, of the things that absolutely. Like. You, you've hit the nail on the head there. A lot of the time, particularly on TV as well, you see these programs, it's, it is glorified. There's not, it doesn't give a true insight. You know, it's very rare that you see a police program that, that gives a true insight. But but you would you would be carrying so much work that you wouldn't be able to get through it. So then, you know, like, and I mean, it'd be things like where you'd have to go and visit people at the houses and take statements and, and you know, build these files, but you never got time to, to do that stuff because the new jobs were always coming in. And because the numbers were so short, you'd be sent to them jobs. You'd end up taking on more work at those jobs. And and before you know it, you're snowed under and everybody's stressed because they've got all this, this pile of work that they just can't get through. The public uh, are going mad because you know, they think that you're their personal police officer and that, that that their job is the only job that you're dealing with. So, so you know, when you don't see them for a few weeks or whatever it takes to get round, rightly so, they're upset. I would be the same, but they just don't see the reasons as to why it's taken so long. And it's just, it, it, yeah, they, they, you know, you, you make a, you sacrifice quite a lot to be a police officer. So, you know, your social circle, you have to be very careful with who you associate with what circles you're in, where you drink, where you where you socialise, you know. If you've got a family, you, you I felt a lot of the time you, you're constantly looking over your shoulder, you know. 
if you've arrested people that were known to go to a certain area and you're you're in that area with with your children or your family you're always thinking well what if i see that person now or you know and i have i have been in in places where i've seen people that i've arrested before now and it's just like anything could happen and it's just like you do sacrifice an awful lot just with that when you put someone in prison or put someone in jail what is that do you ever get to see that side of things like is jail a punishment place is it a rehabilitation place do people keep reoffending and who's that on so like how does how does did you ever get to see that side of things and what are your yeah, thoughts yeah you, you do see a lot of it i mean a lot i would say well i wouldn't i wouldn't polite to put a percentage on it but an awful lot of offenders are repeat offenders so the police are contact they're, they're dealing with the same people quite a lot of the time and and you know don't get me wrong prison will be a rehab place for a lot of people but for for a lot of people uh, your career criminals it's like a bit of respite, believe it or not, because they go in, they they get the meals, they know an awful lot of people that are in prison, and then the the sentences don't quite reflect, you know, the 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 crimes that they're committing. So they're only getting, you know, weeks sentence, and then they're back back out offending again. So so I would argue for both that yes, for some people it is rehab and it's brilliant, um, and it does put people on the right path, but on the same, you know, the same sentence. A lot of people don't and they just fall into this whirlpool if you like where it's just like they offend they get caught they get sent down they do the time they come out they offend they get caught and it's just it's just groundhog day it's like that cycle isn't it the people you hang around with and the, the people where you're at it'll just continue to happen until something breaks it yeah exactly. so yeah or something hits you in the face it's like right i need to change my life yeah it yeah and, and you know sometimes it does take something like the birth of a child or you know, or a family member that it could be anything, couldn't it? But sometimes, yeah, there are triggers for people that do make them change. And it's nice to see, you know, when as a police officer, you'd, you'd see people that you had locked up and you see them maybe five, 10 years later and they've completely changed their life around. It's nice. It's, it's good. And, you know, they'll stop you on the street and have a lot of time to speak to you and thank you. I mean, that's that's quite you know, it's quite rare, but it does happen. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine it being a little bit rare, but but it's valuable when it when it hits home. Yeah, it's, it's like, nice. It's nice. So during the end of being a police officer, but also obviously some big things happened and what we'll go into today. So what happened in, well, I guess at the Manchester Arena, and do you want to talk to us about kind of how that kind of changed your life, really? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of people are familiar with what happened at the arena, but for those that that don't, um, in on the twenty second of May, um, a, a terrorist uh, walked in with a suicide bomb uh, strapped to him, and that was something that he prepared at home, uh, had done lots of recce in of, of the building and the venue, and had chosen a night of an Ariana Grande concert, uh, which was primarily filled with families and young people. And uh, the suicide bomber had gone into um, like a, it's like an area that the, the people will come out of the concert. Um, it's known as a city room, but it's it's just like a holding area where people will have to pass through to get out of the arena. And he'd waited until, until the end of the concert. And then just as people were starting to leave, he detonated his, his bomb, um, which ended up killing 22 people, causing thousands and thousands of people you know mental trauma uh, physical injuries that you know people are still receiving treatment for today it was it was massive but it was just the way in which it was such a cowardly attack that obviously it, it just shook the world you know um yeah so that that was kind of what happened at the time again i was a police officer so that particular night i was at home off duty waiting to start an early shift the next morning and I was in bed and then the bomb had gone off and I got a phone call and it was like the bosses at work and they were like, Aaron, it's been a massive incident in the city. I need you to come in. And it was like, that had never happened to me before that, you know, something big has happened. So I literally got out of bed, throwing my uniform on, but I had the telly on um, and reports were coming through the media that it was an explosion um, that they believed there were fatalities, they didn't know how many, but they believed it was caused by a speaker. But the panic around people asking me to come in, I was based in Oldham. So it's like, I just, you just know that it's not, it is a bit more to it. So I literally got dressed as quick as I could, flew into work. Um, and as I was arriving, 
there were a few of my friends off my shift had got the same call. We were all arriving together and it was just a, a really eerie atmosphere. You know, as, as we walked into the police station, we're normally taking the mickey out of each other and having that banter, that laugh and, and everybody was just silent. And you, you know, it was that, tells a thousand words for me it's like you just know everybody knew that it was serious and from there we went in and we got a bit of a briefing in the police station and then we were we were kind of put into teams and sent down to the arena um and and do you know what that first night there was not a lot that that I did personally because by the time we'd got in and got down there everything was locked down at the arena the firearms police were in and and, and whatnot everybody was was doing the job so we came back to the police station <clears throat> and then we were just told that for the foreseeable, we'd be on early shifts. So everybody, I was, my shift pattern went out the window and that was that. So I went home, got maybe half an hour sleep because things were buzzing around in your head, went back to work the next day. And then that was kind of where my journey starts with, with everything because um, we were sent down to a hotel within Manchester that the families were staying at that had that were missing loved ones at the time you know nothing had been confirmed in in terms of who had died and who hadn't and, and my job was just primarily to to look after those families to to protect the privacy from the media who were trying to badger them for interviews and stuff like that and and that was it really just um that was me stationed at the hotel for the next couple of weeks but obviously over that time you're working with the families and getting to know them and you know, every day they recognize me as a familiar face and, you know, and we just built up these relationships and yeah, it just, it went from there really. What did you start to, what did you start to see in the emotions that they were going through and what, like, what kind of started to come up? Cause you're in a, you're in your work mode. So you're kind of, I guess you've got this invisible cloak of nothing can penetrate kind of thing, but then actually you're still a human under there. Like how, how was it for you to be able to cope with it? And what were they, what were the things that you started to really strike you? Yeah. I mean, it was horrific. You're around that, that environment all the time. And, and, you know, they were getting news through and they were quite, you know, visibly upset and, and you're around that. And I knew what, what was happening, but obviously couldn't tell them certain things. They had to be told in, in proper ways. And, you know, you, when you're around that all the time and, and the news, I would then go home on my own and like, like you said, take the uniform off and then you turn the telly on as soon as you get in and it's on the news and it's like, so you couldn't really escape it. Um, but I think, I think for me at home, that's probably when it hit me because I had nobody to, to offload onto. Um, so I would, I was stewing over it all the time. And, but I think, I think you're right in, in what you're saying when you've got your uniform on, it's like you're there to do a job. You try and keep your professional head on and your distance and, but it, you'd have to be a robot not to, you know, these people needed, they just needed an arm around them or they needed a hug and they needed a, a laugh and a joke with you at that time. And, you know, that you just had to, you, you'd, you'd be a robot if you didn't feel that emotion. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's kind of being around it all the time. And that's where my, my, uh, my head was at for a couple of weeks. And it, it was difficult, don't get me wrong. You know, I shed a lot of tears over that time because, like I said, you come home, you put the news on and they're talking about Safi Rose Roussos, the youngest victim. She was eight years old and it was like, you just start to think, wow, you know, she went to a concert to see her idol and, and you know, that happened to her. It's just, it's just horrific, isn't it? Honestly, it is. And even to think about it, it just makes you so sad, doesn't it? That someone could do such a thing like, yeah. oh man, so you've done this 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 you're you're in there you're in that environment where what happens next where do you start to go yeah so i mean from there obviously like i said we spent a couple of weeks together you, you do get to know the people that you're working with so my relationship started to bond with one particular family the tron family uh from gateshead now they june lost her son philip who was actually my age and his stepdaughter at the time courtney boyle so they, you know, they lost two people of, of their family, but but I spent a lot of time with them and just the relationship blossomed and I spent, you know, the weeks afterwards when, when I'd gone on to other roles, we kept in touch every day and over years and years, that relationship just built up and built up and I actually then started to be introduced to 
to other families. Um, and again, that relationship, you know, just built as a friendship more than anything. Um, and we've kept in touch pretty much every day to, to this day now, you know, it's, it's amazing. And, and I think just keeping in touch with them is, is what kind of led me on to, to doing what I do. So doing what you do, I know your whole career changed due to this horrific, uh, horrific attack that you kind of had some, I don't know, how would you call it? Some truth you needed to speak to yourself. You weren't happy. You needed to change what you wanted to do in your life. So what happened there? And then what is it that you're doing now? Yeah. So that, that was a, a night at the hotel. Again, I was on the, the late shift with, with the Tron family and, and they're a big Geordie family. So that, you know, they love a drink and, and like family gatherings is their thing. So a lot of the family from the northeast had come down to to Manchester to support them uh, through obviously what was the most horrific time. And one night we were sat in the hotel, so we had a big table, all the family, everyone's round. And and June, bless her, kind of put her arm around me and just said, "Look, you know, are you happy in your work? And do you, are you happy in life?" And and I, I had to be honest with her. I just said, "Well, no." I said, "Like in the police, yes, at this moment in time." I am happy because I'm doing what I joined to do. Like I'm helping in, in, you know, when people really need you, but on the whole, no, I was hating my time in the police. So she's like, Oh, well, well, what, what, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, Oh, well, I always wanted to be a firefighter. And, and she said, right, Aaron, promise me you'll apply and just follow your dream. Do what makes you happy because look at what's happened to Philip. And not, like I said, Philip was my age and it was her son. And she's like, look at what's happened. You know, life's too short. And I just kind of went home that night and I, I took that away with me and I thought, she's right. Like at any time, you know, tomorrow's never promised, is it? So you've got to, you you can't spend 20, 30 years in a career that you hate. You spend an awful lot of time at work. So why not apply and, and just see what happens? And I did and uh, got through everything first time. And you know what? I've spent five years now in the fire service and I've I've not looked back once. So literally that one person who's had an absolute tra traumatic experience has changed the direction of your life, mate. A hundred percent. And for the better as well. It's like, you know, I'd never, I would, I'd never wish that the, the police had never happened because obviously it introduced me to the Tron family and, and I did get a lot out of the job. I loved, I loved the job for a number of years. You know, I never, never say it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me, but I just feel now that I'm in the right place for me. And, you know, I've kind of fulfilled that childhood dream now. So that's a big thing for me because I like to set myself challenges and, you know, finish them. So it's like that was a massive thing. But but you know what? I've got the best, the dream job now. And, you know, I've got all these families as good friends. So it's it's nice. Just one thing I want to talk to you about. The police, the the, 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 the RAF, the, the fire service, all with the focus of serving people. Mm. Like, what is it that connects you and serving people? Like, why do you like doing that? I am. I don't think I've ever thought about it, Chris. To be honest, I think it's just me as a person. I like, I like to help people on the whole, and I think, you know, I think the jobs that that we're in, the police, they're they're, they're exciting jobs. Um, so I need that from a career, but I don't think there's anything better than than helping people, whatever that may be. You know. I think it's probably the same with uh, with chefs. You know, if they get compliments about their food, it's probably the pinnacle of of why they do it. And I, and I think that's the same for me. You know, it's if if we can save someone's life um, in whatever role that may be, then I can't imagine there's anything better than that to do for a living. Love it, love it. I've never been complimented on my food, so I can't be a, <laughs> can't be can't be put into that chef category. But right, so then you talk about serving. We talked about serving people and everything that you've done. But you're also doing something alongside what you do as a career. Do you want to tell us about what you're doing as well and how you're also serving others and the families that you've supported during the time? Yeah, so as I said, you know, I've kept in touch with the families from from day one and I'm on social media, I'm, I'm close to them all and, and I see still how much they struggle with with what happened. Now, as with anything in the media, over time, you know, it fades into the background a little bit, doesn't it? And other stories happen and, and that's just 
unfortunately, that's just the way the world, you know, it, the world moves on. But for these people, their world possibly ended, you know, back in, in May. And to to see that, you know, I mean, just for an example, at 22.31, which was the time of, of the detonation, the, the families post every Monday night um, a, a message to the loved ones. And, and I see that because I'm in a very privileged position, but it just became apparent to me that, that, you know, they're all really still struggling with what's gone on and, and rightly so, you know, that's not a criticism. Um, so that just kind of prompted me to want to, <laughs> want to do something to help again. And, and I just thought initially I was going to do some fundraising for, for the charities um, that were associated with the bombing at the time, which was obviously the, the, the emergency fund and then the, the Isle of Manchester Memorial Fund. And I just thought, well, I, I'd like to contribute to, to those charities and, and do my bit to help. So set off doing a running challenge. Um, and the idea of that was to, excuse me, to run 22 different 10K races and just dedicate each race to, to each one of the victims. So they kind of got their own day. Um, and the idea was, again, behind it was at the end of every race, I was given a medal for finishing the race. I got each one of those medals engraved with the name of of that victim, and then just give them to the families as a bit of a bit of a memento. Um, but it got so much, you know, attention and 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 it gathered momentum online. And you know, we ended up raising twenty two thousand pound for it, which again is that number. It's just it's so strange how that number follows you around everywhere. Um, so that was that was amazing, you know. That that took uh, just short of a year to do, but you know, like I said, seeing what that meant to the families, those families came out for for their loved ones' race, but they came out to support other families as well on their loved ones. So they all kind of met each other at my races and became friends themselves. So you know, I'm I'm proud. One of the proudest things I'm I can say today is that a lot of these families met each other because of me and, and became friends and they've got that in common to support each other because of I mean there's probably going to be only those people that know what it feels like to lose a loved one in a in a terrorist suicide bombing you know in, in that way so yeah a lot of good came out of that and and I sat down again and after it and I was like that was it was nice to see that and to be able to do that and more so to, to remember the victims by. And so I wanted to carry on raising money um, for them. So I, because obviously I've done the running and I'd, I'd made a lot of friends in the running world, I set up Hive 22, which is a running club, um, completely free of charge. You know, it's, it's an online club. And the idea behind it was that everybody could be a part of the club, no matter where they were from in the world. You know, it's so easy to just go on, online on facebook on twitter instagram and and you automatically part of that club you know there's there's no registration forms you don't have to meet every monday and tuesday night at training it's like you just dip in and out as and when you want and you can chat to other members through the club uh, online and and we host um a number of virtual races whereby people will sign up and they'll pay a fee to sign up and then they'll get a medal in the post and they'll just choose a distance of their choice to run wherever they live and the medal will be posted to them for, for completing that distance. And and that's took off massive and, you know, we've raised, again, over the two years that the club's been going, we've raised another 22,000. So it's, you know, it, I think it's, it's like a, a living memorial because a lot of the families are from all over. I know it happened in Manchester, but they're from all over England, um, one family on in Scotland, so it's it's nice for them to they don't have to come to Manchester to see a memorial site. They they can just be part of the club. You know, our running kit has actually got the names of the twenty two victims on the kit, so it's it's like a living memorial. And believe it or not, a lot of the families are part of it. You know, they've all got the kit. They all go running part of it. It's just it's just a nice thing, and you know, long may that continue. So how do people, so people can just go to the social media yeah. and they can just check it out? Yeah, just literally, it is a simple, we wanted to make it as simple as possible. And 
obviously registration form we don't need any of that it's literally an online virtual club so you go and find hive 22 running club on facebook twitter instagram and you know start following the page and there's community tabs you can introduce yourself you can talk to other members we host um like club runs so every so often we'll have a club run where everybody's invited and we tend to do a little bit of a distance running nothing too dramatic usually a 5k and then uh, and then we'll go for a coffee and some cake and stuff afterwards and sit down and just catch up so it's a social thing as well as you know improving your fitness and, and your mental health i suppose so i love that so that's the that's the the running side of things but in april you've got something really big coming up and do you want to tell us about what you've decided to create and how that's going to go yeah so like i'm not happy unless i'm making myself really really busy <laughs> so again uh to mark the fifth anniversary I've, I've done all the fundraising uh over the past few years but i always said i wanted to do something big to mark the fifth anniversary um and again i had an idea about another run that i was going to do and just the logistics behind it were just ridiculous like my, the bosses at work was like there's no chance you're going to need about a year off work to do it so that that idea was scrapped but then i started to think well what are my passions um that i'm good at and and obviously all the way through my life has been football and you know i'm don't get me wrong I'm, I'm not a premier league footballer but i've i've loved to play football and be involved watch it all the way through my life so i started thinking well do you know what why can't we do a similar version of soccer aid it's so successful you know it, it's a massive thing and arguably manchester where we live is the footballing capital of the world you know we've got manchester united manchester city two of the biggest clubs there so that's where the idea started and i you know i started to run with it and as soon as I put it out there, the interest that it got was phenomenal. Like, you know, celebrities were jumping on it. We'd love to be part of it. So the idea then just started to grow and grow. And now we've got uh, the game all set up. And it's we went into a meeting with Manchester City to the directors. And, you know, that took a while to get that meeting, don't get me wrong. But we walked into the meeting room and within five minutes... They were like, Aaron, we love this. Like, we sold, we'll back it 100%, anything you need. So, the, yeah, the game's being hosted at, at Manchester City's Academy Stadium. Um, it's dubbed Manchester Remembers. And the idea behind it is that it's going to be a team of celebrities against a team of uh, ex-professionals. We've got really big names involved in both teams. And, yeah, we're going to have a game of football and we're going to sell tickets and everything that we raise uh, on that day We'll go into a fundraising pot. We've got a target of a hundred thousand pound, and what we want to do with that is divide that between five charities that were set up by the families that lost loved ones. So there's only been five that the families have set up, but the work they do supporting young people and especially around sports and music is phenomenal like I've, I've been very close in terms of seeing that over the past few years so so we want to go to each one of them charities and give them a, you know a healthy bursary and and continue the work they do as well as obviously remembering the people that, that were involved and what happened five years ago mate this is ridiculous it's amazing amazing how one person's determination mate is creating this whole thing Oh, congrats, man. So how do people get a ticket? How do people uh, join? Like, when is it? Like, the date, the exact date? Like, inf if you want any inf information, mate. Yeah, cool. So so Sunday, the 3rd of April, uh, 2022, it's going to be played at the Manchester City Academy Stadium, which holds 7,000. Um, and to get your tickets, if you follow us on the socials, again, we've got Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So you're looking at MCR Remembers, or if you put Manchester Remembers in, you'll find us. Um, the lineups are all on there. You know, we've got big Sam Allardyce and Peter Reid, Joe Royal um, as managers. It's going to be phenomenal. We've got, you know, big, big names. Um, so, yes, you get your tickets. Adults tickets are £20. Um, children and concessions are £10. And like I said, 100% of everything that we raise will be going to charity. So come down. Enjoy a great game of football. See all your celebrities and your, you know, your ex-footballing heroes, and and yeah, just get involved. It's, it'll be a good game. So we've got Manchester remembers. 
We've got the running club where people can check out as well. Uh, how do people reach out to you if they want to know more about your plans or if they want to support you in any way or any of your ideas, maybe your big crazy idea that you wanted to do? Um, how do people reach out to you, mate? Yeah, so I'm on the socials as well. I mean, I'd say the majority of my work goes through Twitter. So if you have a look through uh, Twitter at Aaron Lee, um, you'll find me no problem there. Um, and my DMs are always open and I'm happy to, to talk to anyone, really. If anyone wants to support me or needs any help or whatever, I, I try my best. Just bear with me because there's a lot going on at the minute if it takes me a day or two to reply. <laughs> and, and this is so true, everyone, just to, to check out and... Last week, I delivered a workshop at a school to sixth form students in Wales. One of the kids was like, I'm really nervous. I want to be a, a fire, I want to be in the fire service, but I don't think I can do it. Do you know any tips or know anyone? And I was like, I'll introduce them to Aaron. And I literally introduced them on Instagram. And literally, Aaron sent so many messages to this kid and he felt so much better afterwards. So it's true. If you do send a message to Aaron, it will get back. Um, but do bear with him because things are going to be getting a little bit crazy coming up. Yeah. But Absolutely. Aaron, this has been so much fun. I do have a quick fire round of questions for you. Let's go. Okay. Yes, Let's do it. Right. So I'm going to start a sentence. You're going to finish it. Nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, <dude>. Anything <laughs> could come out here. So um, if you want to explain about it, feel free to as well. Okay. So it's not going to be so so much a quick fire. <laughs> so yeah. Well, the first bit can be quick fire. See how it goes. So first one. Life is about. Life is about being happy, being proud of yourself, and enjoying it. Mm, I love it. Work can. Work can either uh, make you really proud of yourself and happy, or it can, uh, well, I suppose it can make you quite sad as well. You have to choose your own path in terms of work, but it's a massive part of your life. So I would say definitely be happy in your work. I love that. It can maybe be like a burden or like a jewel. You decide yep. which one. Love yep. that. Um, helping people. Helping people gives you the most satisfaction and the world would just be a better place if everybody wanted to help each other. And, and that's just as simple as that. It's, you know, it, there isn't a better feeling than, than being able to help someone. I love that. I've got two more questions on this. They're a little bit different. So the first one is, how much of what you're doing now is based on luck and how much of it is based on your skills and natural talent kind of or determination, however you want to do it. Like, I think, I think there's a bit of both, to be honest. I think there's an element, but I, I would say that it, a lot of it is driven, like you said earlier on in the interview, by determination and, and passion for what you're doing. And I think you make your own look, you know, a lot of people might get knocked back for something, but then it's up to you whether you, you try again or you just take that as the, the end of the story. So for me, you wouldn't believe the amount of knockbacks and, and heartache that I've had through fundraising. It's very, very difficult. But if you believe in the cause and you're passionate about it, you'll you'll open them doors yourself. It's something that I think that's really important that you said is that determination that we often, loads of us, we think, right, I've got a plan and I'm going to do it. And then things go off your plan and then you give up because oh, I got rejected or I can't do it. Yeah. You just said it like, actually, I just have a determination and not so much a plan to how to figure it out. No. If, if you want something bad enough and you have that determination, you'll make it happen. You'll Whatever that may be, if you just ad adopt that stance, then you'll, you'll be fine. I love it. I love it. And the final question on this side of things is, if there was a government law, an Aaron Lee law, and it was your rule and everyone had to do it, um, what would that law be and why? Oh, wow. Wow. That is a good one to finish on. Uh, I don't know about a law. I just, I think, again, I just passionately uh, believe in, in helping each other and, and standing up for, for what's right. You know, I've had an awful lot of, uh, what would you, how would you describe? There's been a lot of, of bad stuff in the police that's, that you see a different side of, of the world. But actually, a lot of those people, if they would have had that help and support, and put themselves on the right track, then, you know, they might not have gone down there. So I would have to go maybe as cheesy as it is with, with that kind of stance, really. I love it. I love it. There's something that you talk about there as well is that we think people, are, we judge people as bad or good, hmm. but we forget that even people who are bad 
have been through something to become bad for what us looks, you know what I mean, for us to look at them as bad. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very, very vicious cycle because, you know, as children, children don't, you know, they're not born bad people. Nobody is born a bad person. But are they the environment that they're brought up in and the values and, and stuff that they taught will ultimately shape the person that they become? Um, they have choices whether they want to stick with that or better themselves. And I think, you know, a lot of my experience in the police, I was very passionate about incidents involving children because the kids are just, they just, they have no, no choice in the matter. It's just, it's just what they're shown. And that's why they grow up to be sometimes the way they are. But like you said, you get the right support and, uh, and, and you know what? They're no better, they're no wor worse off than, than me, are you? I was looking at a stat the other day that said one in three children in the UK uh, born, are living in poverty. And that support, if you're living in poverty, it's hard to get the support you need to, to help you be the best version of yourself. And that's one in three. And I'm like, one in three? And I was like, surely that's wrong. And it's mind-blowing. You, know, you can believe it, can't you? Because like I said, you, you and the thing is you get to a certain age, once those children become adults, and that's all they've known all their life. They don't know how to step out of that that you know that life into into better social life. It's just it's just what they know, and you know they just get punished for it. And it's yeah, it's somewhere that cycle needs to be broken. It does, it does. And I'm with tales inspiring everything I do. I'm trying to figure out. It's it's a massive thing. Determination, no plan, is somewhere that we have to change the system. Because if we just try and keep helping people, it'll always get to this. It'll always get. So how do we break that system? And yeah. I think I've kind of come to the conclusion that it's individual support for individual people. So yeah. it's not, oh, we're going to help. If I've got depression, you've got depression. We we both need to be supported and treated differently. Yeah, it's not a one cap fits all, is it? Boom, which means that we have need to have more support and more support workers. And, and it has to be based off care and not money yeah absolutely I, I think for me i think a lot of uh my stance on a lot of mental health and stuff like that is that we need to make it more socially acceptable and, and there has been a, you know right strides for that but i just think like like notoriously for example men were were known for bottling everything up and they couldn't you know they couldn't be seen to be weak and, and all that those fake stereotypes rubbish we need to make it, actually, we need to make it fashionable and, let's say, more attractive for people that, that do seek help and admit. And, and you know, celebrities and stuff play a big part in that and, and it's good to see them coming out. But I think over time, you know, once it's it's actually made more attractive and, and I hate the word, but like fashionable, people will, it'll just be, it'll, I don't know, it'll just be, there'll be a completely different stance on it, in my opinion. Yeah, because, and that's where there's more sheep than there are lions. There's more people who do what others do as opposed yeah. to do what you do and stand up and go go off it on your on your own. Yeah, no, that's right. So once that culture changes, then the sheep will start to, the people will start yeah. to follow the culture. Exactly. So love it. So my final two questions, Aaron, I'd, before I get into that, I just want to say thank you, mate. Just oh. Not even thank you for this. Just thank you for doing what you do, mate. It's incredible. Get in thank there. You. Can't wait to put a ball through your legs one day and absolutely like <laughs> you know what? that's not hard that neither. I've got <laughs> legs that are about five foot and a brain that's ten seconds too slow. <laughs> well, you'll be surprised how bad I can be sometimes. But um, mate, it's just thank you for everything you're doing, you're impacting lives and you're doing it out. You're doing it voluntarily, you know. It takes a lot of effort sometimes to be good. Mm. And it takes no effort to 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 achieve nothing. True. So you're doing amazing things, mate. Oh, buzzing. Thank Absolutely you. buzzing. Last Thank two you. questions that I ask okay. every Tales to Inspire guest. Okay. First question, what is your definition of the word inspire? Inspire, my definition would be to set a good example to others in a variety of different ways. Love it. Simple, good example in a variety of different ways. Love it. And then my final question is, imagine you live the longest life you want to live. Like you in your hundreds or whatever you get to, you're looking back and you're like, yeah, I've done the best I could do in this life. What is it that you want to have achieved that has the biggest impact or you're most proud of? I think to to leave behind 
uh, some kind of legacy. It doesn't have to be anything major, but I think if I can carry on the the morals and the values that I were brought up with and pass them down to, to you know, future generations of family, then then that I'm happy with that. I love it. It's so honest, mate. It's so down to earth. Aaron Lee, thank you so much for being on the Tales and Spice yes, podcast, please. mate. Cheers, thank Bob. You. Isn't Aaron Lee just the best, most incredible heartfelt person you've ever met? I can't believe how inspiring he is and humble. His ego was nowhere to be seen. He's doing something to really impact people's lives from a genuine level. He talked about a few things, but also remembering that tomorrow isn't guaranteed. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. So what are you going to do today? If you're not happy where you are, how can you change that? Don't get caught up on yourself and how the plan, I guess he said, right? But just have the determination, the determination to be able to change your situation. And Aaron represents the fact that we can all change our situation and impact other people's lives. Service and helping people are key to the story that Aaron shared. And that's something that we can all embrace a little more. So I just want to say thank you as always. Keep on checking out everything that we're doing. Please check out everything Aaron's doing via the links that we've put in the description. And as always, have a wonderful inspirational week, remembering to inspire that person in the mirror. Take care and have a great week.